Okay, so what we're going to be looking at in the next two or three lectures is a simple example to get you thinking in Haskell again. And the example we're going to be looking at is implementing a Sudoku solver. I'm going to do everything on my iPad from this point on in the module, but as I mentioned in the introductory lecture, you should also think about making your own notes on everything which I'm doing as well. All the code which I'm going to be presenting to you over these next couple of lectures is freely available on the web page for the module. So I suggest that you download that and have a play around with that uh, yourself. So before we get going, uh, I just want to make sure that everyone uh, understands what, the, what, what a Sudoku puzzle is and what the basic rules of the game are. So here is an example of a Sudoku puzzle, and you can see it's a nine by nine grid, and there's some numbers in the grid, and there's some blanks. And the rules of the game is that you need to fill in all the missing squares to complete the Sudoku grid. And there's only one simple rule, or really three simple rules, and the three simple rules is that every row, every column, and every three by three box, so that's like these things, uh, with, the, with the dark red outside of them. Every row, every column, and every three by three box must have the numbers one to nine exactly once. Okay, so that's the basic rules of the game. So let's see if we can solve this Sudoku puzzle by hand, at least for the first few squares, and see how we get on. Um, so I'm going to focus on this particular row here, and uh, that's a good one to focus on because it's only got three blank cells in it. So we know, to satisfy the basic rules of the game, that this row must have the numbers 1 to 9 exactly once, with no duplicates and no blanks. So if we look at the row here, we can see we've got all the numbers between 1 and 9, but we haven't got a 1, 2, and a 3. So we can think, where do these numbers actually go? Well, if you think about the 2, first of all, we can't place a 2, it, oops, we can't place a 2, in this cell because we've already got a 2 here. So we can rule that one out. And we can't place a 2 in this cell because we've already got a 2 up here in this column. So that rules that one out. So by elimination, we need to place the 2 in here because it's got to go somewhere in this row and it can't go in other, either of the other two positions. So we're forced by the basic rules of the game to place the number 2 in there. So then we've got, uh, we've got a number one and a number three. Notice that we can't place the number one in this cell here because we've already got a one in this three by three box. So that would invalidate the rule of the game, one of the basic rules of the game. So we're forced then to place the number one in here. That's the only place it could go. And then by elimination, the three would have to go in here because that's the only place that it could go. There's only one cell left. So what we've seen here is by following the basic rules of the game, we've managed to fill in completely this first row. An interesting aspect of these kind of newspaper Sudoku puzzles is that they always have a unique solution. So there's always uh, precisely one way to fill in all of the empty cells such that the basic rules of the game are satisfied. In fact, for this particular puzzle, which is called an easy puzzle, just applying the basic rules always or just applying the basic rules will completely solve the puzzle. There's always a forced next move where you have to put a particular value in a particular cell. But in general, you may need to think more deeply to solve more sophisticated Sudoku puzzles. So what we're going to be doing in the next two or three classes is we're going to be implementing a Haskell program to solve these kind of simple Sudoku puzzles. And the way we're going to come at this is we're going to start with a simple program, which we're then going to improve in a series of steps. So the simple program will be very inefficient, and then we'll improve it to end up with a highly efficient program which will solve any Sudoku puzzle at the end. This is similar to the way in which we wrote a countdown numbers game solver in the first year. You may remember we started with it an impractical but simple solution um, and we improved it in a series of steps and we ended up with an extremely efficient program that could solve any countdown numbers game problem. So if you're interested in these kind of things, you might want to have a look back at the countdown numbers game solver from the first year. 
So just before we get going, um, I want to mention that the code which I'm going to show you, or the program which I'm going to write for you, is, is not, not my own. It's uh, actually due to uh, a good friend and colleague um, from Oxford, Richard Byrne. And Richard was actually uh, a professor in Oxford and a former head of computer science as well. So again, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you may want to also have a look at Richard's article. So let's now get down to writing some actual Haskell code. So what we're going to do first is we're going to make some basic type declarations. So I'm going to make some basic declarations. And I'm going to come at this in a top-down manner. So I'm going to write a, a Sudoku grid type, and then there'll be some uh, components in that which we don't know what they are, and then we'll fill those in, and then so on and so on, until we've basically declared all the types that we need. So I'm defining a basic type here called grid. And a Sudoku grid is simply going to be a matrix of values. And a matrix is just a two-dimensional kind of array-like structure, which you're familiar with from your high school math, maths. So a matrix just is going to represent a Sudoku grid. And the grids are going to contain what's called values. So there's two things which I haven't told you what they are yet. So I haven't told you what a matrix is in Haskell, and I haven't told you what the value type is. So we're working in a top-down manner here. So now we need to think, well, how can we declare a matrix type, and how can we declare a value type. So for the matrix type, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a parameterized type. So we're going to have a matrix of type A, and A is going to be the element type or the component type or the cell type. And a matrix is simply going to be a list of rows. Okay, so a matrix of things of type A is simply a list of rows of values of type A. And then what is a row? Well, I'm going to define a row of things to be simply a list of things. So a row of integers, for example, would be just a simple list of integers. So if you think what's really going on here with the matrix type, a matrix is a list of rows and a row is a list of things. So a matrix is really just a list of lists. So this is a very natural way to represent a two-dimensional kind of data structure in Haskell. So the last thing I need to define now is what a value is. And you might think I'm going to say a value is an integer, which would be quite a reasonable thing to do. But I'm actually going to say that a value is a character. And that's uh, a design choice I'm going to make to make it easier to display grids on the screen, to actually allow them to be printed. So a couple of points just then to re-emphasize before we move on. So the first point is that the matrix type and the row type are parameterized. So we haven't fixed uh, a value type here. We've said a matrix of things of type A and a row of things of type A. And this is going to give us some flexibility, which we will use later on. Okay, so we've defined our data types to be a bit more flexible. The other point I want to make here is that essentially I could get rid of all of this stuff and just write that a Sudoku grid is a list of lists of characters. Okay, so I could have declared that and that would be basically amounting to everything which we've seen above. A Sudoku grid is a list of lists of characters. So you may say, well, why did I complicate it by defining four types rather than just having one type? And the answer is the matrix type the row type and the value type are useful for me. Okay, these, so these are a bunch of intermediate types and these will be useful for defining some helper functions later on. Okay, so we've defined our basic data type of Sudoku grids. Just to make sure everyone understands uh, how the data type is working, uh, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So the first example I'm going to do is the easy grid, which we had at the start of the class today. So that's one which I found in a newspaper, and it's an easy puzzle. You can solve it by just applying the basic rules of the game. So how could I define the easy grid as a value in this data type? Well, let me write down the first row. Remember, a row is a list of things, and the things here are values, which are characters. So a row is basically just a string. It's a string of characters. So we had a two. Then we had four blanks. 
And this is why it's useful to um, use a car, a char data type rather than an integer data type because it's easy for me to, to count my spaces here and make sure I've got it right. And if I was just writing blanks here on the iPad, you couldn't actually see how many blanks I was having. So I'm going to represent a blank cell by a dot. So I've got a two and then four blanks and then a one and then a blank and then a three and then an eight. And that's my first line. And then I've got my second line, and what I have is seven blanks, or eight blanks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blanks. And then I have a five. And then in the third line, I had a blank, and then a seven, and then I had three blanks. One, two, three. Then the number six, and then three more blanks, and so on. Okay, so if you look on the code, which is available on the web page, you'll find this kind of grid, and in fact, all, all the stuff here um, defined in that code. So that's the easy grid. Let's define one more example. Let me define the empty grid. And in fact, the Sudoku solver, which we end up writing in the end, will be able to solve the empty grid, okay, which is quite, quite uh, an achievement, I think. So I'm going to call this blank. So blank is going to be a Sudoku grid. And how am I going to define it? Well, the blank grid, well, what do I do? Well, I could use recursion here, or I could use some kind of list comprehension or something like that. But there's actually a library function which will make it very easy for me to write this uh, empty grid. And the library function is called replicate. So what does replicate do? Well, you can kind of guess just by its type. It takes an integer, and then it takes a thing, and it's going to build you a list of that many copies of the thing. So for example, if you said replicate, oops, can't spell. If you said replicate 9, and then a single character dot, that will build you a list with 9 dots. So that's like an empty row. So that would build me the empty row, and then all I need to do is replicate that nine times, and that will build me uh, a grid with nine empty rows. So again, I could have defined this using recursion, I could have used a list comprehension or something like that, but actually it's simpler just to use the library function called replicate, which makes it very easy for me to define the empty grid as a one-line Haskell program. So what we're going to do for the rest of today is work towards writing a function that decides if a Sudoku grid is what I'm going to call valid. And valid here is going to mean that the grid has no duplicate values in any of the rows or any of the columns or any of the boxes. Okay, so Sudoku grid is going to be a valid grid if it's not got any duplicates in any row, column or box. And the way I'm going to come at this is I'm going to use three simple helper functions. One which extracts the rows from a, a, a Sudoku grid, one which extracts the columns, and one which extracts the three by three boxes. So let me write these functions first of all. So I'm going to define a function called rows. And what rows is going to do is it's going to take a matrix of things and it's going to pull the rows out into a little list. Okay, so it'll give me a list of all the rows in a matrix. In this case, it's very easy to define the rows function because if we go back to our definition of what a matrix is, a matrix is already just a list of rows. So defining the rows function is very straightforward. I can just go here and I can say rows of a matrix is just the matrix. So you might think, well, this is a completely trivial little function. Why am I even bothering to define it? Well, you'll see that when we define the validity checking function, having this rows function, even though it's trivial, actually makes the definition of the function easier to understand. Okay, so we have this trivial little function definition here. So I want to actually simplify this definition, or I want to consider simplifying this definition. Um, this is basically just defining the identity function. What the identity function does is takes a value and just copies it. And that's all Rose is doing. So a cleaner way, if I wanted to, to define the identity function, I could get rid of this, and I could just say Rose is simply the identity function. 
And if you look in the standard library, the identity function is just id of x equals x. Okay, so this is a bit of a cleaner way to define what the rows function is doing. It does nothing, so we just use the identity function from the standard library. A simple property now of the rows function is this one. So here's a simple property. If I apply rows twice, I get back where I started. Okay, so if I take a Sudoku matrix M and I apply the rows function to it, that will give me a new matrix. In fact, it's exactly the same one. And then if I apply rows to that again, it's going to take me back exactly where I started. So if I apply the rows function twice, I get back where I started. So this is a trivial property here, but we'll see that these kind of properties, which we're also going to have for the columns and boxes function, will turn out to be important later on. Okay. Again, if we wanted to be clever, we could actually write this property in a more concise way. What we could say is if you compose using function composition, the rows function with itself, then you get the identity function. So what's going on here is we're using function composition, which is just normal function composition, which you've learned about in high school. And uh, again, if you, if you can't remember how this works in Haskell, maybe have a look back at the, the first year course. I think it's covered in lecture seven on higher order functions. And all we're doing here is we're taking the rows function and composing it with itself and saying that that basically will do nothing. You'll get back the identity function. Okay, and again, this simple property, which seems completely trivial, will actually be useful to us later on. So we'll come back to this property later. So the next function we want to define then is one that extracts the columns from a matrix. So we've got a function called calls, and it's going to take a matrix of things, and it's going to extract the columns as a list of rows. Well, what does this actually mean? So let me explain with a simple picture. So let's define the columns function or explain what the columns function does on a simple three by three matrix. And let me draw it as a picture here, but this is really a list of lists as we know. So suppose we had the matrix one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and we want to think what resulting three by three matrix would we get? Well, this is very easy because what we're going to do is we're going to take each column and pull it out as a row. So here's the first column. We have one, four, and seven, and we'll pull that out as the first row. So that will give us one, four, and seven. And then we have the second column, which is two, five, and eight, and we'll pull that out as the second row, that is two, five and eight. Then we have the last one, three, six, nine, and we get three, six, nine. Okay, so what we've done here is we've taken each column one by one and made it into a row in the corresponding matrix. And you can ask yourself, what operation is this on matrices? Well, this is just matrix transposition. If you imagine the main diagonal of the matrix, let me change into red here, that's there. If you flip the matrix about the main diagonal, that's what the columns function has done. So it's just basically matrix transposition. It's flipping about the main diagonal. And this actually allows us to define the columns function in a very simple way. I can just write calls equals transpose because there is a library function in Haskell which takes a matrix represented as a list of lists and just transposes it. Okay, so I don't need to actually go to the labor of manually defining the function. But again, if you want to do well on this module, think about how could you actually define the transposition function for yourself. That's quite a nice exercise using recursion or kind of list indexing or something like that. This function also has a useful property. And it's a similar or the same kind of property as we had with rows, but this one is less trivial this time. And what it says is if you apply the columns function twice, which means if you compose the columns function with itself, so you take the columns function, apply it once, and then afterwards apply the columns function again, that should get you back to where you started. 
And it's very easy to see, at least intuitively, by looking at the picture, that this is the case. Because if you flip or transpose a matrix twice, so if you flip it about the diagonal and then do the same again, you will get back to the same point that you started with. Okay, so this is just saying that if you transpose a matrix twice, you get back to where you started. Again, you might think, well, why, why should we care about a property like this? But we'll see later on that these properties of the rows, columns, and boxes function actually turn out to be very useful and important to us. So the last of these function is the boxes function. And what boxes is going to do is it's going to take a matrix of things of type A and it's going to pull out the boxes as rows. Okay, so again, I'm going to illustrate what this does using a simple picture. So let me work with four by four matrices here, so I don't need to draw quite so much stuff. And let's imagine that we have two by two boxes in them. So let me kind of make the border of the matrix a little bit thicker here. So there's the is a four by four matrix. And let me draw another one over here. If I was clever, I could copy it, but I'm not, so I won't. So there's the resulting matrix here. And again, you can draw the border a little bit thicker. There we go. Okay. So what is boxes going to do on these four by four matrices with um, these two by two boxes? So let me fill in some numbers here. So let's fill in numbers 1 to 16. So we're going to do the same kind of thing as we did with columns, but this time we're doing it with boxes. So here's the first 2 by 2 box. What we're going to do is pull this out as the first row. So over here we will get 1, 2, 5 and 6. And then we have the second 2 by 2 box, 3, 4, 7, and 8. And we have that over here. So we get 3, 4, 7, and 8. And then similarly, we get the 9, 10, 13, and 14. That will become this row. We get 9, 10, 13, and 14. And then we get the last one. We get, oops, in the wrong order. Let you see what I'm doing. We get 11, 12, 15, and 16. Okay, so we've simply taken each of the two by two boxes, one after the other, and pulled them out as a row. Defining this function is actually, it's a little bit tricky, so I'm not going to go through the details. The details are actually not that important, but if you want to see how to do it, have a look at the online code. And um, I'm not, I think it's still quite a messy definition. If any of you work out how to do this in a cleaner way, be quite interested in, in seeing how you did it. So there's a property here again. And the property is exactly the one you'd expect. Now, if you apply the boxes function twice, you get back where you started. Okay, so let's have a look to see why this might be the case. And uh, maybe change to a different color here for a second. If we take the first two by two box, that became this row over here. Okay, and then if we think if we did the same thing on this side, so if we take now the first two by two box of this one and we push it back over here, that's what we get. We extract it as the first row. So what you're seeing here, if you kind of generalize this and look at all the boxes, um, is if you apply the boxes function twice, you'll get back where you started. So here we had this one, two, three, four, and that moves over to the right hand side. And then correspondingly, it'll move back over in, when we apply the boxes function again. Okay. So if we apply the boxes function twice, we'll get back to where we started. Again, may seem like a useless property, a trivial property, but it's going to prove to be very useful to us later on. So this brings us to the point now where we can actually define what it means for a Sudoku grid to be valid. So remember, a Sudoku grid is valid if it has no duplicates in any row, any column, or any of the three by three boxes. So let me define my little validity checker now. So valid is going to take a Sudoku grid and give me back true if it's valid and false if it's not. So 
So how am I going to define this? So because I've got these three little helper functions, it's actually going to be very easy to define it. All I'm going to say is if all no dupes rows g, all no duplicates in the rows, all no duplicates in the columns, and all no duplicates in the boxes. Oops, boxes g. And this is essentially just a one line definition, which I've written over three lines here, because otherwise it wouldn't fit on the screen. So a grid is valid if there's no duplicates in any row, any column, or any box. And this basically just translates this directly into Haskell code. But of course, there's a few bits and pieces here that we don't know what they mean. So we need to just kind of make, make sure we understand these. First of all, what's this guy? Well, this is just logical and, okay? Saying there's no duplicates in the rows and there's no duplicates in the columns and there's no duplicates in the boxes. Then we need to think, well, what does the all function mean? And what does the no duplicates function mean? So let's do that. So all is actually a simple library function. And what all does is you give it a function which returns true or false, which is called a property or a predicate. And you give it a list of things and it's gonna give back true if the property is true for everything in the list. So for example, if you said, if you started up GHC and you said, oops, that's wrong. If you started up GHCI and you said all even, and then the list two, four, six, it will give you back the result true because everything in that list is even. So how is all actually defined? Well, there's a nice little two line, uh, one line definition for this in the standard library. So if you have some property P and some list X's, all we're going to do is and P of X such that X comes from X's. So what's going on here is we're taking each value in the list one at a time. We're applying the property P to it in a list comprehension. This will give us a list of trues and falses, and then we're adding them together. So you only get true back here if everything in this list is true. So the property P is satisfied of all the elements. Lastly, um, we need to define the no duplicates function. So this is not a library function this time, so I'll define it. And it's got an interesting little type so the type is this one. So what no duplicates does is it takes a list of things of any old type A and it returns true or false depending on whether there's any duplicates in the list or not. But of course, when you're checking if there's duplicates, you need to compare things for equality. So you need a little equality constraint on here because for example, you can't check if a list of functions contains duplicates because you can't compare functions for equality. You can only compare certain types for equality. So how do we define no dupes? Well, no dupes, we'll do it with recursion. We say if there's no duplicates in the empty list, that is true, and no duplicates in a non-empty list. Well, there's various different ways we could do this. What I'm gonna say is if it's not the case that the element occurs again, so LM, detects whether an, a particular value occurs in a list and we want the list never to occur again, otherwise it's a duplicate, and we want there to be no duplicates in the tail of the list, the remainder of the list. Okay, so that's all we're gonna do today. Uh, we've basically just reviewed what Sudoku puzzles are, set up some basic data type declarations, and we've defined this function called valid up here, which decides if a Sudoku grid is valid. So there's no duplicates in any of the rows, any of the columns, or any of the boxes. So that's it for today. I'll see you again next time.